economics. So to that end, welcome to union and let us join together. Let's stand in worship and allow our lives to be disrupted and reoriented. Good morning. My name is Antonio. For those who don't know, um, I know a lot of you guys and I'm still getting to know some. Um, so thank you for allowing me to be up here today and read some scripture. Um, when Renee first asked me to read scripture today, um, I didn't know what to think, but I was happy and thrilled when I saw what scripture she wanted me to read. Um, just because it just had a major impact in my life. Okay, thank you. So it's in Romans chapter 8, 31 to 39. And it says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? Who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all who will not how he will not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword and it is written for your sake we face death all day all day long we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us for i am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the living word of God for today. Thanks be to God. Lord, you made us for yourself. You delight in us. Oh Lord, we come here. We come here seeking you only to discover that we are already found in you because that scripture that Antonio read is the truth that we rest in today nothing can separate us nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord and to that we say amen 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 Oh, friends, it is really good to be together. Um, more and more, I realize how much I need this time with you all. And I mean that for you online, when we see your faces, when I read your comments in the chat, it is a joy to be together. I do want to let you know that um, there's some cards on the back for Jeanette Harney. Jeanette is our amazing, often behind the scenes person. She's our operations lead. She, I often call her our executive pastor, you all, because she does so much. She sends out our climb on. Um, her mom passed away uh, a week ago Friday. James B and I were able to be with her on Friday in Spokane. And it was evident to us how much being part of 415 Kakeo Union means to her. So if you could take time to sign the cards for Jeanette, that would mean a lot. Well, I have a confession to make. A few weeks ago, Renee Sundberg spoke of an approach to scripture that was encouraged when she was in college, which was to write scripture verses on index cards and carry them around. Well, I was one of those people who did that. In fact, I did it in college. I would meet with another friend, and we would write down random verses as fast as we could, and then we'd plan to memorize them during the week and meet on Friday, and then we'd quiz each other. 
I had a lot of random verses memorized with absolutely no context. They were words that I worked really hard to learn to see if I could memorize them faster than my friend. And I often won. <laughs> and I have another confession to make. As I was memorizing random scriptures on my index cards, I was quite a judgmental person. Now, those of you who knew me in college, you may disagree, but actually you might agree. <laughs> oh, I was nice. I was a nice person, but in my heart, oh my goodness, I had the great gift of comparison. In fact, I was so judgmental, I was kind of exhausted. Because after a while, that comparison that you carry in your head does get exhausting. The pride of wondering if you're better than someone else does get exhausting. It's exhausting to attempt to be a good Christian, to accomplish the Christian faith. There really was little love in me because I was so absorbed with myself. There was little love in me towards other people, even though I could act it. I was constantly comparing and measuring up. Am I doing a good, good enough for you, God? Am I doing good enough for you, God? That's lonely. It's lonely, those attempts to follow that, that tightrope toe to heel, making sure you don't waver too much, that you might fall off too far and have to do extra work to make up for not being a good Christian. But I remember one day, scripture index cards in my backpack, and looking around at these people that seemed to have such a better life than me, and they didn't even seem to know God. And I felt, I was like, it, I cracked. And I said to God, I'm done following you. With all the just the passion of a 20 year old, I'm done following you. Look at all these people around me. They don't even know you, and they seem to be doing much better than me. They're enjoying life, they're carefree, and I'm just so exhausted. I'm done with you, God. And I threw my index cards away. The irony is that the weeks and months that followed as I proclaimed, really only to myself, but I proclaimed it loud to myself, that I am not a Christian, I discovered something stunning for me. I couldn't throw God away. I could walk away from God, but God just kept being there, maker of heaven and earth. In some ways, God was more present than ever. And you know where God was most present? It was in those people that I had been judging. And it was in that moment and space where I had just no longer seeking to prove how good I was to God, to see me as a good person, that I heard, and you know, it's not that necessarily audible voice, it's that sensing, it's that awareness, but I had this overwhelming sense, just almost like drawing me to my knees, and yet quiet affirmation of our creator, Renee, I'm good. I'm good. You are loved. Your goodness doesn't come from what you do, your accomplishments. Your goodness comes in how I made you, who you are. So jump off that tightrope of doing life perfectly, because guess what? You're terrible at it. <laughs> and jump into this wide field of grace. This is where life is. This is where people are, my people. And suddenly there was a shift in me as I looked at all these people that I had judged because, did I tell you, I judged them? <laughs> and suddenly I began to see this joy of knowing people, the beauty of others' divineness, also made in God's image, also longing to discover their intrinsic worth, also struggling and hurting no matter they were marrying a mask or a facade or there was genuine joy. And this is also 
when I began to love scripture. Because scripture is God's love story for God's people. And I became like a detective. All those verses I had memorized didn't now seem so disparate. As I asked, how does this all fit together in God's big plan? I bet you guys didn't know I could talk with one hand as big as I can. When Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, how was he communicating to his Jewish listeners who knew Psalm 23 by heart? Jesus saying, that's me, that's me. I'm the one who walks with you through the darkest valley, who leads you beside still waters. And I found that God was transforming how I saw other people. Memorized verses would come to mind. I remember one time so distinctly when I was speaking unkindly about someone in front of others. And these words from Ephesians 4, they just burned in my heart. They stopped my lips. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up, that it might bring grace to those who are listening. And I also discovered that the unfolding story of scripture is best understood together because it is a story for community. It's a story that's to be told and read and received together across our world and throughout time. Sometimes the absolute best times of being in scripture is when you're with people that are as vastly different as you can imagine. And you hear someone else talk and you go, I have literally never thought of it that way. And you understand God in a whole new way. I'm struck that scripture reveals how we are part of a larger community, exploring with spirit how to be the new humanity Jesus came to create. But I also wonder if we can truly grasp that if we only read it alone. To grasp the more fully, we need to read scripture together, not just alone. Well, one of the index cards I loved was Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and, to not, and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Like so many of us imagine, I read this verse, cut out of context, magic potion, just for me. And oh, my prayers, as I prayed this verse, who should I date? I actually told James B. no the first time he asked me. What should I study? <laughs> Where should I live? What should I do? How should I be? God, what is your plan for me? Isn't that exhausting? And I found with this prayer of so individualistically prayed, it was kind of lonely. And I look around and think, I'm not really prospering. I don't feel very hopeful. And yet, what about other people? What about other people prospering that are much worse than I? And it was just confusing, to tell you the truth. But reading together brings discovery, epiphanies, heartache over places where injustice is rampant and we are called to pray together. Reading together invites questions, gives space for our doubt, brings imagination. So today, my friends, my question, what happens when we are committed to take a piece of scripture that we've been taught to read individualistically and look at it afresh together, in context, in community, with curiosity. And when we read together, asking questions, how am I reading this for another person and their story? When we're receiving it and listening to it, what is this saying? What am I hearing for how we live together? When we ask, what is the invitation? How am I responding? Asking, what is this text asking, not just of me, little old me, but us? What is this text asking of us in bringing God's reign to this world? Living it forth, God brings the reign. We're looking at Jeremiah 29. This is very brief context. 
Jeremiah wrote in the time of big empires. The kings of the little nation of Judah turned from God's way because they wanted to play ball with the empire of Assyria, with Babylon, with Egypt. And in all of their compromising and giving up and turning away from God, they were nothing compared to those empires. And so in 597 BC, Babylon was seized. Babylon seized Jerusalem, and the first wave of exiles were deported. In 587, Nebuchadnezzar seized Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed, and more people were taken into exile. Think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That Babylonian empire terminated Judah's existence as an independent political entity. Full stop. The question that Jeremiah prophetically raises is, how do we live when we are not in control and power? What does it mean to be a people who still trust God's ways are true? Can we be people of shalom, of wholeness, of prosperity, when we're not on top? Hear Jeremiah 29 to prepare us for sharing about it together. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders, because there were elders still in Jerusalem, the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But, but, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. That word welfare is shalom. Seek the shalom, the prosperity, the peace, the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your shalom. Welfare. Let's go two more. But thus, so says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, the Lord says. Jeremiah briefly is warning about false prophets that have cropped up, maybe making some profit of it, I don't know, but making promises that all this hardship will end quickly, especially because their approach was one of resistance that would lead to violence. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah's wisdom, it says, not yet. This isn't God's way. That just leads to more destruction, devastation. Don't get caught up in the dreams and the, of others that aren't of God. I think there's a warning there. There's so much to unpack. And again, how does Jeremiah invite the people instead to live in the midst of empire? How are they observed? How do they live as a people seeking the welfare of a city? As we observe the text together, is there an invitation for us of how to live in the midst of empire? And do you notice how Jeremiah is transforming exile into a place where we seek shalom, welfare for the larger community, so that when we return home, may that ever happen. When life might become more stable, we're not the same. Because we have become in exile, in the place where life is uncomfortable and uncertain. We have become people who seek hope across borders, beyond borders. We have become people who have a bigger view of a future with hope for community. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill you my promises and bring you back to this place. 
For surely I know the plans I have for you all, says the Lord, plans for all of your welfare and not for harm, to give you all a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and pray to me, I will hear you all. When you all search for me, you will all find me, if you seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you all from the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you in exile. So now your invitation. It's okay if you're scratching your head. One of the things we do together is we interrogate scripture. Now your invitation. How do you read this passage together? How does this word from Jeremiah in the 6th century BC inform our life together? Yes, for you who are new, we do small groups. You are the sermon now. You are the message to one another. And I will say that some of the best things to say in this room are right here beside you. So listen 